Matthew chapter 4. And let's go ahead and read verse 18 through 22 and we'll get the context of of the scriptures and then we'll go ahead and and get into the word. Now Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea and they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Then they immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, and in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him, that is Jesus Christ. And I'm going to focus on that verse 21 there concerning the the sons of Zebedee, their father, and who they left their father. And what it all pertains to in being a father of two fishermen in that time and culture, uh, what he had to teach and train his children to, to do. It was the famous philosopher. We all know him very well. If you grew up in, in, in my uh, time, you probably would have seen his uh, television series. His name is Bill Cosby. And he said, fatherhood is... Pretending the present you love the most is the soap on a rope. That's fatherhood. You know, we get some odd presents, don't we? <clears throat> a tie, soap on a rope. Here, Dad, this is for you, you know. Do I stink? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and you just pretend to love them because it comes from their heart. And I always love the fact that when they're little, you know, and their moms help them to make a Father's Day gift, whether it's a drawing or whether it's clay or a handprint or something like that. You just see their hearts and their love for you, and they just want to give something to you that puts a big smile on your face so that they can feel like, wow, I did something for Dad, you know? And that's always a neat thing to see. Yet we see in our culture today that fathers are challenged in raising children. Even more today, I think, than even in my own culture. It's a totally different culture. In, my, in the culture that my children were raised up, they were raised up in a culture where videos were just starting to get into the, um, into the market for children. There were some, but it wasn't a whole, whole lot as it is today where you have iPhones and their apps and all kinds of stuff that they can just be busy on these things all day long. And so with my culture... and and raising up my children was a lot different than today. The challenge is today is getting those children motivated to even do something. And because they want to just be behind that screen, just playing and pushing buttons all day, and they're content in doing that. And what happens is is they're not um, building those skills that they need to socialize with society. They're unable to find friends. They're unable to to relate to these people, they're unable to relate to adults and stuff because they're secluded in a little room just playing games all day. And oftentimes with their parents too, playing games, which I don't have a problem. I played games with my children, but there was a balance that I found with them. And so, guys, and I'm speaking to the men today, guys, you're challenged if you have younger children with uh, the culture today. The culture is so much more flamboyant. You know, um... They're more free to do things than ever before. There's so much going on in the school systems that wasn't going on in the past as far as sexuality, expressing themselves, and and, and so forth. There's a a sense of, um, because of the movie industry, there's there's a sense of walls and barriers that have been broken down and they don't feel that that, uh, things are inappropriate anymore. And there's that challenge there. With the young children too, I know a couple of teachers, you know, in our in our church here that uh, have shared with me some of the things that happen just in our own little community here at Harupa Valley High, and some of the things that go on there that are definitely uh, against the school's rules and so forth. But teachers are too afraid to even confront them, and others are are, are not even concerned about the various issues. And so, fathers, you're challenged. With, with a greater challenge than ever before with your children. And so much more that you have to really, you know, take time and, and talk to them and, 
um, share with them the scriptures and pray with them and, and lead them and guide them and love them and, and have grace towards them. Be active in their lives and, and don't let them get in ruts like the video games all day long. You know, lead your families. Stand up and be firm and be strong in this culture, in this day and age, because it's a challenge. Now, as we look at the text here, we see a father, a fisherman, who God had decided to call into the ministry. Now, let me just say something about that. Every one of us who have accepted Jesus Christ are in the ministry. Every one of us are in the ministry. If you have Jesus Christ in your heart and you are born again, guess what? You have entered the ministry because you're ministering constantly. The word minister really just means servant. You're serving. And so as a husband, as a father, you're serving your family. You are ministering. Your family is in the ministry. It is in the ministry within the kingdom of God. And it is a reflection of Christ. And so everything that you do, people are watching you. People are listening to you. And it reflects Christ. And so every one of us are in the ministry. Whether it's the ministry of your family, whether it's the ministry uh, within the school districts and your job or even in the church or whether it's in the ministry in the ministry here at the church, teaching the children's, you know, helping serve here, you know, uh, part of the uh, food ministry or even in the staff ministry. It's all ministry. Every one of us are in the ministry. And so as I speak here, I speak to all of us as being called into the ministry. Now we know from the Gospel of John at this point that they already knew Jesus. They knew something about him, probably saw him, walked with him, and so forth. But this was the dividing point for them uh, to really get into the ministry. Now they have a choice. And Jesus gives them this choice as he calls them into the ministry to be not just fishers, fishermen, but fishers of men in the ministry. And by the way, we're all called to do that. We're all called to share our faith, to be a light, to be salt to our community. And our families are very, very much a part of that. I understood that when I was raising my children, that, that my family was a light to those around us, especially to my own family. You know, to my mother, my father, to my brothers and sisters. And so everything that we did would reflect Christ. Though it was very strange to them at the time, they didn't understand it. We were all raised Catholic. We understood going to church on Sunday, you know, fulfilling the sacraments. But then on Monday, you know, just living life, you know, without any restraints whatsoever. And all of a sudden... Uh, you're there on Wednesdays, uh, you're there in conferences, you're, you're always at church, and uh, what's going on here? What's the difference? You know, why are you so committed? And, and these things were strange to them, and so we had to be that light and stay cons constant with it. Even though they invited us to birthday parties, they invited us to events, there were times we didn't go because church came first, God came first, and we made sure that we put Him first so that they knew that beyond a shadow of doubt, we love God more than we love anybody else, and they cannot say that we don't, uh, because the evidence is there. And so we understood that our family was was in the ministry, and we, re, we, we affected people around us. Doesn't mean that we were perfect. You know, we had our times, especially as they grew up uh, in life. In verse 18, Jesus said, walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon and Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, and they were fishermen. Now, several years ago, I got to visit Israel, and that was probably the, the highlight of my life at the time, to actually be in Israel and see all the, the landmarks that were there concerning Christ. If, if anything solidifies your faith in Christ Jesus, it is Israel. Just going there really strengthens your faith because of these landmarks, this, these historical places that really existed, and you know they existed because the evidence is just right there and it's so clear. And so beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know, I believe that, that Christ was a historical figure in our world. Uh, you just cannot deny it, unfortunately, because we don't go there, because we haven't visited uh, those type of museums and artifacts and seen those things. We kind of have this thought in our mind that maybe it's not real, it's not true, but it is. And when I was over there, um, I had such a great time. We had gone to uh, Peter's, Peterman's uh, Wharf, I believe it was called. It was a restaurant. It was on the... Um, I believe it's the east-north side of the Sea of Galilee, and it's right on the border of Israel. 
and, and um, we were walking into the restaurant to eat, and I didn't like to eat in Israel too much because the food was so different. I, mean, I, I wish I would have taken a lot more snacks, and so I ended up, ended up eating schnitzel. Schnitzel is just uh, uh, chicken smashed down with breaded stuff and, and sesame seeds, so it was probably the only thing that I really ate. Everything else was so kosher without dairy, without butters and stuff, and it just tasted so strange. So well, there we were, and we were getting ready to eat these fish that they could catch out of the Sea of Galilee. And these guys were, were heading towards the uh, water. There was a little dock, and they were heading towards there, so I just thought, they're going fishing. And so I asked them as I ran over there, hey, you guys mind if I fish? From your pole, I probably needed a license or something. I didn't even think about that. And they were like, yeah, well, you can fish. And so I thought, I'll pay you for it, man. I'll pay you just to fish out of the Sea of Galilee. And so um, I was able to take their pole, throw it into the line. They, they used bread, and almost immediately the fish started biting the bread. And that was the highlight of my life, to be able to fish in, in the Sea of Galilee as the disciples fished in the Sea of Galilee. It's an amazing experience. From that point on, everyone else that was with our tour, like, we want to fish too, we want to fish too. It was just an exciting time. Every, every year for 20 years, I've been going fishing with my family uh, to Bishop. It's become a tradition now. I started off with Virginia's uh, family, uh, her father, as I was a young man of 20, um, not knowing the Lord and just getting that whole new culture within fishing, because I never fished before in my life, not like that at least, on a constant basis or fresh water. Usually it was deep sea with my dad. But uh, doing that, and I have created wonderful experiences with, uh, with her family, but also with um, my own boys as it transitioned once her father passed away into us as a family going to Bishop every year. And usually it was the boys, and now it's transitioned to where it is uh, not just the boys, but their wives too. And it's a whole different uh, type of relationship because we go up there and we laugh and we, you know, we just have a great time just spending with one another, you know, fishing and in the room all night, laughing, playing guitar, praying, you know, and, and just doing all those things. It's just, it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. Uh, my father used to take me deep sea fishing. Some of you might know there used to be a, a wharf out at Seal Beach. Uh, that you could go to. You remember that? Uh, in, before it sunk. And um, we would go out there as children, and he would uh, show me how to deep sea fish. And usually we, we caught those, I think they're called rock rockfish, uh, that blow up when you bring them up because of water pressure, and they just blow up, and they're red with little pointers. Get a lot of that, or halibut, you get some of that. And those were fighters and so forth. I remember one time my dad, my dad says, do not leave your pole unattended. And so there I was, hanging on my pole, and for some reason I wanted to go get a sandwich or something, so I walked away, and all of a sudden I look, and my pole went, phew, flying into the air, and the fish just took it. Oh, he was so mad at me, because he needed to pay for that pole, and he didn't have enough money to pay for it. So he literally had to drive all the way back home to Roland Heights, and he had to leave us there because um, uh, they did not want to give him back his license unless they had something uh, showing that he was coming back. So we stayed there. He came all the way back home, and then he went all the way back there to pay them for this pole. So he wasn't a happy camper at that time. But I remember those times fishing. You can, you can only imagine what you learn if you've been a fisherman or gone to the lake or deep sea, what you learn in the time that you spend with your family as you're fishing. It's good times. A lot of lessons in fishing. You know, a lot of things that go on in that atmosphere. Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting their net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Um, then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Here we see Jesus interrupting their lives uh, to offer them a greater life. And that has happened to us as, as men and even as, as people where Jesus interrupts our lives and, and he gives us a challenge. And he says, would you like to come to know me and serve me? Would you get into the ministry? And it's a choice that we all have to make to get into the ministry. Uh, nothing is more important than being uh, fishers of men and spreading the gospel. That's why we're having this summer outreach, this huge step of faith. For some reason, I have a peace, though it looks scary. There's a peace about it because God is in it. Any time that you want to reach out to the lost, God is in that. That's something that, that he will definitely be in because that's his heart to reach the lost, bring them into the kingdom. Uh, he wants to see everyone saved. The scripture says he, he wishes that no man you know, would be unsaved. 
or that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance in Jesus Christ. So nothing more important than him. And then verse 20, immediately they left their nets and they followed him. So without hesitation, um, he called them immediately. They followed, obviously, because they had spent time with him earlier. Now, this is where I want to spend some time. Verse 21 and 22. Let's read it again. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father. Mending their nets, he called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Now, the word mending there is a word that means to adjust or put to right. It may be that what they were doing was either mending their nets because they were ripped or they tore because of the load of the fish or because of wear and they were constantly repairing and maintaining it. Or it could mean that they literally, after they were fishing, they took their their nets and they were preparing it for the next day that they were going to fish. Either way, there was a preparation that they had to perform in order to maintain those nets, which was work, which is part of the livelihood that they were involved in in fishing. It was part of their job. It was their business. They needed to know the ins and outs of how to fish when you're uh, fishing like that as a business. Now, God uses uh, simple, humble men to raise children. Now, here's a fisherman, Zebedee. We don't know a lot about him, but that he was the father of James and John, who were brothers. Zebedee is all we really know. Uh, he was a business owner. He owned this business of fishing. He had servants. Uh, that's clear in, in Mark chapter 1. Uh, where he, it says that they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants. And so he ran this business and it was a family business with his sons. God has given this simple man wisdom to raise four young boys. And when I say that, I say that with sincerity and truth because I was not the smartest or the brightest person in the world before I knew Christ. I didn't understand what it meant to to raise four children. I thought before Christ that it meant, here, Virginia, you take them. They're your responsibility. I make the money, and then uh, uh, you take care of the kids. I'll go out and have fun and enjoy life and do the things I like doing. And that's what I basically did. I made the money. I gave, gave her what she needed to support those kids, and she raised those children uh, alone. Well, I... After work, was out playing basketball. I was out partying with my friends. I was out doing things. So I really had no great wisdom nor even a desire to raise children. That was her responsibility. And then all of a sudden, God comes into my life and he changes that completely. We notice some things about this father, Zebedee. They worked, obviously, with uh, their father. And so they had a relationship with him. Not just, not just a relationship um, being related blood-wise, but a relationship in business too, which is always uh, uh, interesting because it's not always the easiest thing to do. When um, I married Virginia, I started to work with her father, and her father was a co-owner with his brother with a company called Acrotech. They designed and made uh, transistors and transformers that would... Um, transducers that would measure and weigh things. It didn't matter what it was. If you wanted something weighed, they would make and design a, a electronic tool to measure it. Uh, they, they did things like hair stress for Redken. You pull your hair, one of your hairs out and they would measure at what point does the hair break and they would recommend what kind of shampoo you should use, real technical stuff like that. Or they would make uh, uh, these transducers that would weigh all the stuff before it goes into the space shuttle, you know, things like that. And then her brother worked uh, also in the company, and then I worked in the company, and you can only imagine what that was like. You know, for a while it went really nice, but then after a while it didn't go very nice, and there was some, some great arguments and, and splits and, and so forth like that. So it's not always the easiest thing to do, working together, but obviously Zebedee here uh, and his family worked together. The fishing industry was, was a prosperous industry to work at that time. Uh, they did pretty good. They weren't poor at all. I mean, they, were, they weren't wealthy, but they made enough to survive on. I can remember helping my father. As a young boy, he needed to make extra money, and so he uh, took up a trade of um, 
repairing dented cars. And so he'd bring the cars home. And I don't remember how many cars he actually worked on but then before he quit. But he would literally bring cars home and he'd, he'd fix the dents. And at that time, they didn't have all the technology today. So you literally had to get what they called a, a knocker, screw it into the dent, knock it out, you know, and then sand it all the paint off until it was metal then take your bondo sand it bondo sand it different kinds of you know all those things but I spent a lot of time with him doing that and that was some neat time uh, to actually work with him uh, hand in hand you know uh, removing the dents and talking with him I, I can't remember a lot of the conversations that we had it was more like okay do this next put the mesh on those type of things but it was time that I remember spending with my father you know, it was just a special time. I worked with my son Modesto. Uh, I was a laborer. It was cheap labor. He was my boss. And, and, and so as a carpenter, we worked in Long Beach on a home together. And, you know, it was every Saturday when, when uh, and I think I was at the church at that time, uh, still working with the, in the church. I'm still working in a church, but it was on Saturdays just to make a little extra money. So I'd go with him out to Long Beach, and we would work on the on the house, doing molding, just finishing work and stuff like that. And that was such a neat time. You know, I ask a lot of questions. That's just the way I am when I'm working. I respected his place. He knew what he was doing. I just did what he said because he's the boss. You know, and, and so. But I'd ask questions, why are you doing it that way? What are you doing here? And, we, and I know sometimes it comes off like I'm trying to tell him what to do, but it's not. I'm trying to understand because that's just the way I am, and that's the way he is too. That's how we learn. That's how we uh, do what we do because we ask questions and we try to figure out better ways of doing it. But that was a neat time, you know, working with him. It's neat working with your, your sons, working with your boys, working with family. There's, there's, there's substance there. And so forth. So their father taught them some things about the trade here. But what did he teach? Well, he taught them about business. You have to be a good business type of guy. You have to understand the business. You have to understand the ins and outs. You have to be honest. You have to be sincere. You have to pay your taxes. You know, all those things that come with running a business. Uh, good character and those type of things that you teach your children. Management. How to manage. Uh, don't just do one thing, start another project, another project here, but manage well so everything flows well. That's you know, something that Zebedee taught his, his sons here. Teaching them patience. Teaching them patience, right? Mending nets, the mundane thing every morning, putting everything in the boat. You know, every evening, taking everything out of the boat. Every morning, putting the nets, throwing them out in the water, you know, and then taking them in, bringing them back, so forth. So teaching them patience. And I'm sure there were times where they were impatient children, you know, when are we going in? How much longer are we going to be out here? Well, we haven't caught any fish yet, you know? Well, we caught a lot of fish. Can we go in now so we can spend some time with our friends? And so we're just all those things that he probably taught his sons. He taught them the love of family, which is so important. You know, we're doing this business. Why? For our family. So that we can be supported. So that uh, your brothers and your sisters, if they had sisters and their mother and so forth, can live a, a good, comfortable life. That's another reason for doing it. The Bible teaches a lot about families, doesn't it? And serving together as families. You go back all the way to Adam and Eve. And they tended the garden. They had Cain and Abel. Do you think they, they shared with Cain and Abel how to tend the garden? How to plow? How to maintain? Yeah, of course they did. It was something they handed down to them. And we see that in scriptures. We see it with Abraham and uh, his son Isaac, you know, and Ishmael. We see it with uh, David and then passing the whole kingdom on to his son Solomon and so forth. Uh, Jesus, his cousin John the Baptist, they were in ministry together. We don't realize these things. You know, remember John, uh, Mary comes to, to Elizabeth and, and John kicks in Elizabeth's womb because the Messiah is in Mary's womb. And they understood that spiritually somehow. You know, and they were in the ministry together. John came to prepare the way for the Messiah, his cousin, Jesus. You know, and then we see here, uh, like today, we see these brothers, uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John. You know, they're brothers, they're in a the family. And God calls them as a family to serve together. And of course, today, there's great examples. You see Chuck Smith and, and Brian Broderson passing it along to his son-in-law, his daughter, the whole ministry, and other Calvaries like that. You see our ministry here. And sometimes people get a little upset because they... they I, I heard somebody once say that's um, nepotism. 
You know, if you leave your ministry to a child, that's nepotism. You know, you're just because they're your, your son or they're your daughters and you're just giving it because of that reason. And that's not true. That's just not true. There's something more to it than just that. There's a spiritual connection there that takes place, a like-mindedness, a, a, a understanding, a routine that, is, that has been going on for years within that family. And we see it here. Myself, my son, assistant pastor, my son serving and helping in all kinds of various ways. I just took a picture today. My granddaughter doing sound now. You know, and that's how it works. And it should work that way with you too. Is that you serving, then you know, your spouse serving, then your children serving. And that's what it is. It's family serving in the kingdom of God together. Building the kingdom of God in that way. Most children will say they believe in God. They'll believe in Jesus Christ. He or she will believe even in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet... They don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And they don't understand His love, His grace, His mercy. They have no connection with Jesus whatsoever. And that's where we as fathers come in. We have to stir that connection up somehow. It's a work of the Spirit. I understand that. But we have a play in that. And that's something that we need to understand as fathers. We can't just let our children grow up and not stir up the spiritual aspect of their lives. We have to question them. We have to push them. We have to direct them. That is our responsibility. What did I do to stir up that spiritual aspect with my boys? Well, first of all, let, let me just say this. Those of you that have younger, younger children, as they grow up, they're going to be so different than one another. They just are. That's just the way it is. And, and I know there's not a lot of you here that have younger children, maybe a few, but for those on the, on the audio too, understand that every child is differently made by God with different personalities. Uh, some of them are very outgoing, very happy. Some of them are introverts. You know, they don't like to talk a lot. They won't say much. You know, they're all different. They think differently. They view things differently. It's just, it's just a part of life. You have to understand that. And so you approach them differently in that aspect. I have one son that I didn't really have to discipline at all, but just raised my voice, and he knew what I was talking about because of his personality. As soon as my voice raised, boom, he changed his whole demeanor. He would be obedient. He would do what he was said because he did not want to get spanked like he saw his brothers get spanked. So his personality was totally different than the others. Others would get their spanking. They would correct themselves, you know, and do the right things. Others, even though they got spanked, they didn't care. They kept going at it until they got spanked again and then again and then again. And then walk out the room and say, that didn't hurt. Okay, let's do it again. <laughs> you know, they're all different. You know, they're so different. So understand that, that they are different. But we apply the same principles to them. And that's important for us to understand also. We apply the same biblical principles to all of them, even though they are different. Now, we're trying to stir up their relationship with Christ. We're trying to get them to understand there's more to it than just knowing Him, but having Him in your heart, being concerned about what He thinks about you, and having a personal relationship with Him so that you're reading, you're praying on your own without Dad and Mom telling you to. It's because you love Him. You have this connection with Him. How do you stir that up? Well, one thing that I did as a young believer uh, is that I began to read. I began to read books, not by the world, but by Christians like Dr. Dobson. I got all his books and I started to read about children and how they were so different. How to raise two-year-olds, the stubbornness of two-year-olds, you know, uh, teens, how to get them through the teen lives, you know, because they're so different at teens with the hormones, you know, they're one way at one point, another way at the next, you know, they're just constantly changing in their views and ideas. My granddaughter will, and I can say that without them knowing who I'm talking about because I have six of them. My granddaughter will one minute be happy jumping up and down, and the next she's like, don't talk to me, leave me alone. You know, just, just the change that's just in their life so quick, like, what happened? Nothing, I just don't want to talk, you know. It's just really different. And so you have to understand all things. How do you get them through life? So I read all these books. Of course, reading the scriptures helps because you see the family relationships within the scriptures. You find the truths within the scriptures that, that we need to know about what is right and what is wrong, what is moral and immoral, and so forth. And then you begin to apply these things to, to your children. Now, here's the thing that I think is important, is open communication. Open communication with your children. 
what I did was, when I was working, Virginia was the one leading and guiding the children, picking up from school, you know, training them, teaching them, doing all those things with them. As soon as I got home, that was my responsibility. I'd do all the discipline, but then I would also stir up their faith. We would oftentimes sit at the table as we're eating, and I would throw questions out there. And it was always spiritual, because I was more concerned for the spiritual than I was for the physical. It didn't matter. I'd tell them, I said, I don't care what you do in life. I really don't care what it is. You just better get to the other side. When I die and I'm in heaven, I'm going to be waiting at the gates and I'm hoping that you're going to walk through there because I'm concerned for that and that alone. And it's not about right now what you're telling me. It's about later on that you're still walking, that you're still living that walk so that when uh, you do die that you're going to go to heaven. And I, I just kept harking on those type of issues. You know, I'd ask them, what makes a believer? What is a believer? You know, and they would talk and share. And then I would also make up scenarios. What if this happened? What would you do in this scenario? You know, and then they would ask and say, why would you do that? Well, because the Bible says, or, or they would just give me ideas. And then I say, well, are you sure? I don't think you should do that. I think the scriptures say this. And I'm like, oh, okay. And it makes sense. So just keeping that dialogue open to spiritual things constantly. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have fun. Because I think having fun and, and having an active life together is also important. Um, the boys were, as they grew older, in teen, teen years, I kept them busy with sports, at least uh, two of them, in, in tennis. And so I was active with them in tennis, went all to their games, encouraged them, and you know was a part of that life. The others were mechanics, encouraged them. Another one was just whatever you know, he did, you know, encouraged him. He was young, that is Roman, was young, loved the Lord a lot, I think, more passionately than the other boys not that their relationship was different, but just his passion for God. And so he, at a young age, at, at teen, in high school, was involved with Harvest and, and reaching out uh, to the community and, and so forth as an evangelist and, and things like that. So he had a group of friends that he, he hung around with uh, doing that. So just a, a different uh, personality. So I took opportunities as they, as they grew older to talk about dating. You know, let's set some rules for dating. I didn't set them. Again, I read the stuff in Dobson. Don't set them. Make them set them. It's their rules, and then they've got to keep their rules. And so I sat down with them, and I, I said, okay, let's talk about dating. And, of course, the older one says, well, I think we should be able to date. And the younger ones are like, Ugh, no, I don't think we should until we're 20. I go, I like that idea. <laughs> you know, and so, forth. They, so they came up with dating and dating in groups. You know, uh, you don't date alone. You don't get along with anybody, you're in groups, you go out, you have no girlfriends until, you know, after high school, they, ne they better be Christians, they better have a, their faith in Jesus Christ, they better love the Lord, you know, all these things that pertain to, to marriage eventually. And so just taking that time, and I think that, again, just to go back, I almost need to do a series on this, just to go back, I think the main important thing is keeping the communication open with your children and talking about spiritual things, uh, and getting into the Word of God. Uh, we had devotions every night. Uh, we didn't make it through the whole Bible, but we made it through most of the New Testament before they grew up, but we would have devotions every night. We would pray every night before they went to bed. Um, we made sure that was important in our lives. Uh, I think that helped them to understand that. We set rules up so that when they did get into the video games, you know, and they spent hours, then we start realizing they're spending too much time with the video games, they're spending too much time with their friends, so we made a rule. If you spend an hour in the video games, you spend an hour reading. And so then they would lessen their time with the video games because they knew it would mean more time reading the Word of God. We'd buy them videos. Oh, this is very important, I think. Buying them Christian videos, whether it's cartoons, whether it's stories, wh whatever it is, and we would make them watch these series. The Dr. Dino series on evolution, psh, they watch those things all the time. These are things that help them understand what Christianity is about. And I really believe the video aspect of it really helped them later on in their career when they went to school because they were able to confront their professors and say, no, I don't agree with that. And some of them would get a little upset. Uh, my son Simon, who went to the University of Cal Poly, uh, he said thank you at, at the end of uh, his graduation. He said, if you would not have taught us these things, you know, I probably would have fallen into the whole evolution theory. Yeah. And so these are important things. Oh, so many more that the Lord had uh, given me. And again, I'm not patting myself on the back. What I'm saying is these things work when we apply them, make an effort. What I find today 
is that men are not willing to make that effort because it does take time. It does take time for you to sit down and talk about these things. And we get so busy. Our priorities are so wrong. We have to work. We have to pay our bills. But then you're, you're missing out on that time with your children. You're missing out on training them. And that's why some of them are not walking with the Lord. It's sad when I hear of pastors... And I know that it's not necessarily their their fault, but it's sad when I hear that pastors' children aren't walking with the Lord. I meet several pastors, and then some of their children aren't walking with God. They've strayed away and so forth. And, and I just kind of wonder in my head, what, what is it that they didn't do? And what would help others to not do those things, you know, but to somehow stir up their faith in Jesus Christ? Important stuff of being a father. You know, I was thinking... This morning as we were, were worshiping and praying, we had a, a birthday party for Virginia and my mom last night at this uh, Chinese Chinese restaurant out in, in Rancho, all-you-can-eat buffet. So we had all the family out there. And my sister in Texas right on there, I wasn't there. And my dad used to always tell us this. I'm going out because we'd ask him, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to Timbuktu. I go, Where's Timbuktu? Or do you say, I'm going to Cucamonga? And we're like, where's Cucamonga? And he'd make those little phrases all the time to us. And we were like, what is that? And so I, I, I wrote back to my, my sister. I says, nobody told you to, to move out to Timbuktu, you know. And, and she wrote back, ah, oh, that's what Dad used to say. And I go, I know, he used to say Cucamonga too. You know, you're, we're all the way in Cucamonga and so forth. And then I started thinking about it. You know, I miss my dad. <clears throat> and then they were writing, yeah, we miss Dad too. <clears throat> because my dad, you know, has passed away. And I miss the relationship. We didn't have a great relationship. We didn't talk a lot. But when he was over, we tried to spend as much time with him as possible. He had a hard life. You know, I don't blame him for the, some of the decisions he made because he had a hard life. He ran away from home at 13. And he had to survive. You know. He wasn't always the kindest man uh, to my mother or the most loving man uh, to us. But he's my dad. <clears throat> you know, and you just miss that that connection. And knowing that he doesn't know the Lord makes it worse. And sometimes you just want to not think about it, you know. But he taught us through his life some very important things. Not his mistakes, because I know the mistakes that he's made. Some of them I made with him. But just by his own character, his work habits and various things. He taught me a lot. And I wasn't the greatest dad either. <clears throat> I don't expre express the greatest love to my boys as much as they probably deserve. But my heart is, is for them, just as your heart's for your children. You love them so much that you want the best for them. And sometimes we don't always have the right words and how to express them. And so we let God kind of step in the way and hope that God will work it all out somehow in some way. Just don't stop. <clears throat> don't stop. Be faithful. <clears throat> Apply those things that God has taught you and trust in Him. Pray for them. It never stops. You pray for them even when they're older. I pray for my boys all the time and now my grandchildren. And as I realize I'm getting older and older and won't be around, some of them I'm even preparing now as I did with my boys. The other day, uh, Taylor Ann, she's the second baby. Is, um, I tickle her under her armpit. I just put my finger there and she laughs. She laughs. And then also she goes, stop, you can't do that anymore. Okay, I won't do it no more. I promise I'll never do it again. And then I told her, oh. I go, wow, by the time you get married, I probably won't be around. She goes, you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> I go, I won't be around. She goes, no, I promise you I won't do it. No, come on, you can do it. Because she's like, oh, because one day I'm going to be gone. You know, and, and now Luciana, only two, I may not see her at 18, you know. Those are the things that, that life brings about. And so, you know, taking that time. We had her this uh, Friday, and we got into the jacuzzi. We swam around. She's two years old. She's like, throw me in the big pool. And so I grabbed her, and I'm Swimming, she's kicking her legs. I'm swimming, I'm swimming. You know, and it's like my day was blessed. I was just blessed just to be with her that day. It just blew me away. I text my son and said, "Happy, Happy Father's Day, son, and thank you so much for Luciana because she puts a smile on my face." 
And I love them. I love them to death. Dads, <clears throat> Paul said this to you. 1 Corinthians sixteen thirteen. Watch. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. <clears throat>